you. <laughs> Thank you, David, in one voice. Aren't we blessed to have such an amazing music program? <laughs> Yay. Um, this morning, I get the pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Reverend Sally Robbins has been a minister for 20 years and is ordained by the Centers for Spiritual Living. Reverend Sally came to the ministry after over 25 years in the corporate and entrepreneurial world. Her background includes extensive experience in sales and marketing, television and radio advertising, and production and event production. Reverend Sally is a contributing writer to Signs of Mind magazine and has also served at the national level at the Centers for Spiritual Living in a variety of roles, including three times being named co-chair of the CSL event committee. Reverend Sally has recently moved to Charlotte and is happily becoming a North Carolinian. The title of Sally's talk today is The Outer Limits. Would you please give me a warm Welcome to Reverend Sally Robbins. Well, hello. hello. Now I get to figure out how this comes up. A knob. I'm going to let them figure that out. There. I think it was at the level for Peter Dinklage before, and so now. Okay. Well, good morning. Y'all look fantastic. Man, what a fabulous group. I just, I always adore coming here. It's such a wonderful consciousness that you step into when you come into this building, isn't it? You can really feel it. And I have to address one thing really quickly. I realized last night as I was watching the news that the last time I was here, which was in August, someone came up to me that morning and said, are you going to address the tragedy? I don't even remember what tragedy it was because we keep, aren't we getting numb to this now? And I realized that yet again, I'm here on a Sunday morning when we just had a mass shooting. And I, I realize that this is the time when we get to really walk our walk. Can we really be peace and love and kindness and compassion during a time where we are outraged, when we are feeling like, oh my gosh, what is happening to this world? This is where we get to do our work. This is where I get to really look inside myself and say, where am I being violent? Is it by gossiping? Is it by saying something unkind? I'm not shooting anybody, but I can shoot with my words, can I not? Where am I being violent to myself? And so this is where I get to go in and do my work. And so I invite all of us to share in that responsibility that this is our world, and we get to create it, don't we? And so we get to walk our talk this morning. I have a quick reading from the Talmud. Do not be jaunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Isn't that beautiful? We have to at least put ourselves out there as best as we possibly can as love. And so, of course, that dovetails beautifully with what I'm talking about. Isn't spirit always in charge of everything, right? So the title of my talk this morning is The Outer Limits. Now, if you're of a certain age, of which I definitely am, you might remember the TV show. Anybody remember that show? So The Outer Limits was something that came on from 1963 to 1965. Am I that old? Yes. Oh, my goodness. I was a mere child when it came on. But I vividly remember this show. I vividly remember it because it only ran for two seasons, but the first season especially had some really wacky monsters. Some really wacky ones. But that was the beauty of this show, 
was that was cutting edge technology back then, right? <laughs> and actually, the men, uh, Leonard Nimoy and William Shatner actually starred in different episodes of Outer Limits, and several of the things that were developed for the Outer Limits then went to Star Trek. So there was a, there was a lot of things that happened that, that were uh, up-leveling in the television industry back then. But today, don't they look kind of tame? <laughs> tame compared to the monsters that they create nowadays? And I remember watching one of these shows and somehow my parents let me watch it. I think it was a treat. And so I'm watching it, and I go, then it's time for me to go to bed. And I was terrified that there was a monster under my bed. I was convinced I could hear him breathing under my bed. And I was so convinced in my mind that that monster was fully present in the room with me that I finally just wrenched up the courage to get out of my bed and walk to my door and call for my parents. And then I made them check under the bed to make sure, nope, no monster here. But do you remember your child's mind being that vivid where you created something? And how many times have we done that in our adult life? Have you ever had a, some sort of conflict with someone and you work out an entire script of what you're going to say to them? Well, I'm going to say this, and then he'll say this, and then she'll say that. And then when you get to the actual meeting of that person, it's nothing like that. Or am I the only one that's, that, that's ever happened to? We, can't we make up some real drama in our minds? And so I know that we are very capable of creating our own monsters, are we not? Very much capable of it. Because that monster was so real to me at the time, and I look now and I see, well, what are the monsters that I've created now in my adult life? You see, we have perception and reality. And we all know that if we perceive something, it does become our reality, right? Now, we know it's still reality with a small r, because the reality with a large r is what? The truth of who you are. And the truth of who I am is that I'm always safe, I'm never unprotected, and that nothing can really harm what the real me is. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. And yet, isn't it so easy for our human mind to take over? And the little r becomes so big, we think it's the big r. And it really, it is not. When we make up our monsters, I, don't, I won't ask you to raise your hands on this one, but can, have you made a monster maybe out of your ex-spouse, your ex-anything, your colleague, your boss? Anyone ever make a monster? Even some people have made a monster out of a political party. Mm-hmm. And yet, and yet, isn't that giving our power away? giving our power. So I want us to think about that idea this morning. That the outer limits is when we're focused so much on the outer, guess what? The outer limits. The outer limits. Let's say that together. The outer limits. Because if we're looking at the outer, there's a limit, right? As to what it is. If we go into the inner though, the inner is unlimited. It is changeless. It is the truth. It is spirit. And so when I find myself in the outer, I have to remind myself the outer limits. It's time for me to move into the inner. You know, we even make up nightmares and monsters that populate our life until we recognize them for what they really are. Have you been in a class here or maybe it's sitting in a Sunday service and all of a sudden gone, holy moly, I can't believe I thought that all these years. And now I know the truth. That is not the truth of who I am. So, for instance, if we have trouble paying our bills, if we have too much month for our paycheck, anyone ever run into that problem? A few of us. 
If I just had a little bit more money, we say to ourselves. Now, we've just had a wonderful chance to think about that, haven't we? With the lotto and the mega bucks or the whatever they're calling it. And I see reporters talking to people, excuse me, how, if you won the lottery, how would you spend that money? And people are so excited about telling how they're going to spend their money. And yet I don't hear a single reporter say to anyone, what must you become in order that you are so tied to the prosperity within you that you never lack for anything? Have you ever heard a reporter ask that question? I haven't. What must you become? And so that is the inner work because the outer limits, guess what? If you get another job, many of us have been down that path, we get another job, we get more money, right? And how long does it take until we're in the exact same place <laughs> with too much month and not enough money? And a matter of fact, we all know the statistic that even lottery winners within three years, unless they have worked on their consciousness, are right back to zero. So there is a, a shift here that I'm asking us to instead of looking out here, how can I change my world? I'm still holding my microphone. <laughs> That's the reporter in me. <laughs> Here. <laughs> Instead of looking to the outer, we get to look to the inner. So what must be the underlying causation? The underlying causation, because isn't that what we look for in religious science? What is the causation of this? Because if we go back to first cause, which is spirit, God, we know that we're in the right place. So how did I, how did I sin, which we know is simply a, an archery term for a mistake, how did I move out of alignment with who I truly am? So I've, I've paired these inner changes with a couple of modern day monsters. So how about this one? Pennywise, the clown. People can't be clowns anymore, can they? They're, they're all scary now. So if we really are having all these prosperity issues, perhaps the underlying cause is I am not enough. Because then if we get a little bit more, we still have. I am not enough. And so what must you become to understand that not only are you enough, you are God stuff itself. You are made out of the God DNA that knows that you have the cattle on a thousand hills. And so when we move from that place, then we truly know, we truly know that we are in alignment with a capital R of who we are. I had, I had several people ask me, because the last time I was here in August, I had just been laid off from my job. Pretty scary. That was a nice little monster I'd created for myself to kind of make sure that I was going back to that inner. So while I'm doing the outer work, because of course we have to treat and move our feet, I was also doing my inner work. And that, that question kept coming up, what must I become? To know that God is my source, not an employer, not the government with unemployment, that wouldn't support you anyway, but you get the drift of what I'm saying. What must I become that I know that God alone is my source and that there are so many channels that that good can come through? So I'm doing the work, I'm doing the work, not much is moving. September goes by. I don't have trouble finding jobs typically. I, I'm highly skilled in what I do. And I really was mystified. What is going on here? Then we get into October. Now I'm really going, oh my God. Okay, Spirit, what is to be revealed here? What, must is, what is coming up for healing? And so the inner work that I was allowing myself to do came up with, do you really, really trust? Do you really trust that God is all there is and that God alone is your source? And I got to work with that. Three weeks ago, I found out why I had not been hired by anyone. I got a phone call from someone who I knew in Phoenix, I moved here from Phoenix six months ago, 
And she said, I really need to have someone who's in charge of my business development and my marketing. I think you might be the perfect person. That started a conversation. We uh, continued the next day, and she hired me. I've been working for her for three weeks. I get to work out of my home. I get to, work, I get to live anywhere I want to, basically. She's in Phoenix. Isn't that the beauty of technology? And I'm doing work that I love to do for someone who is a practitioner herself. We start every session when we, when we uh, Zoom with each other, Skype, we start with, with treatment. How much better can it get than that? And so I'm just so grateful because not only is this the perfect job, she's replaced the salary that I lost. I am so grateful. This is my opportunity to th say thank you, Spirit. But it wasn't because I was running around only looking in the outer, the outer limits. I had to do the inner work as well because somewhere in there was still, I thought I had gotten it all out, but there was something in there still that was saying, you are not enough. And those of us who excuse me, grew up in families where you were only as good as your last act of you know your, how well you did your chores or whatever, and that's the kind of household I grew up in, I simply translated that to my work. And I got to really take a look at that again as well. We have to do our inner healing. Other beliefs, other nightmares include, I am broken. Isn't that what uh, Michael Myers thinks? He's broken. And I remember the story of Carolyn Mace, who was telling this on a CD that I was listening to. And she said that she was at some place where she was doing a workshop and, and a woman walked up to her and introduced herself. And within five minutes, the woman had told her pretty much her entire life story, including all of the wounds that she'd had from her childhood and how she was still dealing with those wounds now. And Carolyn Mace called it, this is the first time I'd ever heard it called that, she said, she described her woundology. And she was totally invested in her woundology and her wound of who she was. And Carolyn said, the reason we have awareness of that woundology is so that we can rise up and move beyond it. And some people are still staying stuck in that wound. And so they're still relating to, I am broken. Somehow I'm not, I'm not full, I'm not whole. And so I invite you this morning, because the outer limits, we're not just fixing the outer, but where are you feeling broken on that inner realm? You see, what must you become so that you are not your wounds anymore? You don't identify with your wounds. That's where we are wanting to be. And a final belief nightmare that we create, I am unlovable. I am unlovable. Many of us have bought into this idea at some point. Louise Hay used an affirmation, one of the most powerful affirmations I've ever used. Would you like to hear it? Would you like to hear it? Yes. Okay. Louise Hay said, if you're feeling any of these beliefs coming up, where you know you have inner work to do, this affirmation will move you up and out from that belief system. And that affirmation is, I approve of myself. Let's say that together. I approve of myself. Again, I approve of myself. Do you feel a shift that happens as soon as you say that? Just the very vibration of you saying those words. And so when we are stuck in the I am unlovable, or I am broken, or you name your nightmare, I approve of myself, allows us to take full stock that we are the God stuff that we came here to be. And that we can set aside the limiting beliefs that we might have brought as baggage into this particular circumstance. I am enough. I approve of myself. I have to tell you that I used I approve of myself quite a bit in the last eight weeks. Because I recognized that, isn't it Emmett Fox that said, 
he said, when you are struggling, go back to basics. When you're in fear, go back to basics. And so that's what I did. I went back to the basics. I approve of myself. Louise Hay says, say it to yourself 100 times a day. You can't do it too often. And so as soon as you get into that realm of not only I approve of myself, but wow, what employer would be thrilled to have someone like me? That's the, the place that I got to. Guess what? The doors opened. The doors opened. I was getting very frustrated with Spirit's timing, though. I must admit that. <laughs> Can you relate to that? And so I knew that I had a human disappointment about God's appointment. And I had to get over that. God is always on time. Spirit is always in the right time. So the outer limits. The outer limits. We must move from that outer to the inner. Remember when I showed you this the last time I was here? The four stages of spiritual growth. <clears throat> the top left, we see stage one. We're in victim land. Everything happens to you. And so then we have to move to stage two, which is what new thought starts out being, because you learn all these wonderful tools. And you get to learn about treatment. You learn about um, affirmations, visualizations. But you see on the far right side on stage two, you have to give up control. And that's where a lot of people put the screech on the brakes. I'm sorry, I still have to be in control. And I had to do that myself because to move into three, God moves through me. <coughs> then we know that we are simply the vehicle for spirit. That was what I had to do. Because honestly, when I first got laid off, I was like, what do I do? How do I get take care of it? Who can I contact? It was all the outer, right? That's wonderful. But I needed to do the inner as well. So I'm asking you to change. I'm asking you to move through these four stages of spiritual growth and move into stage three and four. Ernest Holmes had this to say, what the world needs is spiritual conviction. You all know this. It's one of the most quoted quotes in Science of Mind, followed by spiritual what? Experience. I would rather see a student of this science prove its principle than to have him repeat all the words of wisdom that have ever been uttered. It is far easier to teach the truth than it is to practice it. Can I get an amen on that? Oh, so many of us can spout those words, can we not? This is where we get to really live it. This is why you come together in community <coughs> to remind yourself, I'm here to do this together. I want to tell you about someone <coughs> who moved into Vessel 3. <coughs> Her name was Harriet, Harriet Tubman. Harriet <coughs> was a five foot nothing, I mean, she was a short, short woman. She was born a slave in 1820, and yet she developed the consciousness of freedom. No matter what they said to her, you're not worth it, you're nothing, she said, <coughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am. She was regularly beaten. She was forced to work as a young child, even when she was ill. And when she was an adolescent, she was sent to the, the store to pick up something for her master, while she was there, another slave who had come from another field, <coughs> had, um, he, was, he was there not by permission. So the foreman comes up and sees the other young man, and the young man would not go to him. And so he said to Harriet, hold him for me, and she refused to do it. He took a two-pound weight and threw it at her and, it, and hit her. He was hoping to, to get him, but it got her. Hit her in the head. She was knocked unconscious. They took her to the, um, the home that was nearby. She laid on the floor for two days with no medical attention. I'm sure she had a concussion at the very least. And because of this, she began having seizures and narcoleptic attacks. She would have them for the rest of her life. She actually said this was a chance for her 
to be closer to God. She was seeing visions that she was convinced that God was giving to her and through her. In 1849, she was 29 years old. She decided, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Is there a Kleenex back here? (laughs) There's one next to you, Devon. (laughs) Thank you. So in 1829, 49, I'm sorry, she says, I'm leaving Maryland. Now, when you left the plantation, you were taking your life in your own hands because they would kill you. So she took her brothers with her. They got to above the Mason-Dixon line. Her brothers had second thoughts. You know, we really should go back. Now, yeah, can you believe that? What does that tell us about how when sometimes we move across the line into change and then we sometimes scurry right back? Her brothers forced her to come back to Maryland with them. She was not happy about that. But soon after she got back, she said, enough of you two. I'm going back again. And so she did. She left and she took several people with her. She had to do this in the dead of winter because that was when people weren't outside. So it was cold, it was freezing. They had, you know, had to figure out the Underground Railroad where to stop. This woman was literally taking her life in her hands. She went back several times and one of the times she went back, she went back for her husband. Her husband had already remarried a woman and he said, I'm sorry, I'm happy right where I'm at. And she said, okay, I'm done with you. (laughs) You just stay right here. And she got some more people and took them with her. In all, in all, she made 13 expeditions back to Maryland. She didn't have to do that. She could have stayed a free woman. But she decided this was her life's work, to go out there and be the vessel of change that God had decided was her mission. So, she'd guided over 70 slaves to freedom and she provided explicit instructions to many, many more about how to do this themselves. How did this woman, who stood only five feet tall, she had a disabling injury, had been told repeatedly that she was worth nothing. She decided that she was going to be the change, the inner, inner world. This is what she said. Every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember, you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars and change the world. She had no outer limits. <laughs> she knew that she was a vessel of God, here to become that very essence of freedom herself. I'm going to close with a quote from Carl Sagan, one of my favorites. He says, somewhere, something is incredible waiting to be known. And it's only known if we move beyond the outer limits to the inner. I invite you this week, take this and see where you can do your work on the inner. How can you be a vessel for positivity, for change, for good in this world? Isn't that why we're all here? Not only are we here for because it's a happy day, we're here because it's a transformative day. And you are the transformation, the transformative force in this world that the world is waiting for. I invite you to step into that. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right. Go forth and change the world. Namaste. Thank you, Reverend Sally. Now, as our welcomers come forward, if you are here for the first time, go ahead and raise your hand. We want to acknowledge you. We've got uh, some people in the back. Thank you for being here today. We really appreciate it. Our uh, welcomers have a little card for you. We can keep in touch with you and let you know all the wonderful events that are going on. Just check email only if that's how you want to be contacted. We don't inundate you with uh, anything And um, they also have a gift for you after the celebration out in the Welcome Center. So welcome. John and Barbara will be back next week. Um, 
So thank you. Thank you for being here. Now I invite our prosperity acceptors to come forward. Go ahead and take out what you're going to give. And know that the energy that we create in the giving of this, it's a back and forth. It's, a, it's an exchange that happens with spirit, with, within ourselves, with this community. I know that these gifts that we share today are amazing and more meaningful than a simple passing of a basket. This creates prosperity in our lives. It creates prosperity uh, with those around us. It creates prosperity for our center. And that surely ripples out into the world, into the allness of who we are and what we are. So knowing this energy exchange that happens with this giving is powerful. It is purposeful. It is amazing and full of love. So let's go ahead and repeat our investment affirmation together. I freely and joyously give from the abundance and fullness of my overflowing wealth, knowing my gift goes with love as it touches and blesses the world, and so it is.